Here we find ourselves with a parallel RLC circuit. One branch has resistance, one branch has inductance, one has capacitance. And as with before, we're assuming this is a theoretically pure inductor. We're ignoring the resistance that would be in the coil. So RLC, pure inductor, theoretical. Okay, and what are we gonna find in this one? We're looking at our currents and our impedance. We'll also have to find our inductive reactants and capacitive reactants in the process. Now, there is a formula method. It's a two-step formula method. We'll go over it in class. It's also in your textbook. Uh, but in this video, I'm just gonna use the method to find total impedance of doing what first? Finding my branch currents, adding them vectorially for a total current, that then I can use my source voltage and my amperage to get my ohms. Okay, so let's start right off. We can figure this out, can't we? 120 volts divided by 15 ohms, eight amps. How about here? Oh, we need to get our ohms, right? We remember inductive reactance is two pi frequency, 60 Hertz times the inductance. And capacitance is one over two pi frequency capacitance in farads. Don't forget these are microfarads. And again, feel free to stop the video, do your calculations, make sure you come up with the same thing, within rounding, of course. And there we have it, 24 ohms and 10.9 ohms, respectively, on the inductor and the capacitor, based on a frequency of 60 hertz. Again, those are my reactive component components. Now, I could figure my total reactance, but I need a formula for that. It doesn't just add or subtract or anything like that. But we can, based on this ohmic value, and I wrote the voltage across on each branch. I highly recommend that. Just because you have total voltage here and you know it's the same on each branch, if you actually write it on each branch, then the numbers are sitting right in front of you. And you see you've got volts, you see you've got ohms, you can figure out amps. Volts divided by ohms is amps, and likewise there. What do we end up with? Five amps and 11 amps. Now there's there's something going on between these currents here, right? The resistive current is just doing its neat thing, going with the voltage, right, in phase, doing the whole thing. The inductive amps are lagging behind 90 degrees. The capacitive amps are leading the voltage by 90 degrees. So it puts these two exactly opposite from each other. You know what my vectors are? And yeah, they're flipped from the series, right? Here in the parallel, the capacitive amps point up and the inductive amps point down. So I can simply just take the difference between the two and get my net reactive current or my total reactive current, my IX we'll call it, X for reactants. Okay, but I wanna show you what's going on here. Because they're opposite each other, these amps, and it's AC with the resistor, it takes its amps from the top, they come this way, and then they go back again this way. Same here and here, but they're off cycle from each other. So we'll just draw some arrows here. When these amps here are going this direction, up, coming from here, these other amps are going down. So if I've got 11 amps going here, trying to go home, and this thing's looking for five amps, what do you think? Five of those amps are just gonna dance up here. And how many amps are gonna go home? We're gonna have something like this. See how that is? 11 amps are leaving this guy. Five are gonna jump up there and only six are gonna go home. And then when they change direction and these amps start coming down and these go up, let's see what happens. These amps start coming the other way, right? Because they're going back and forward. These amps start coming down, five amps. The inductor doesn't really care whether they turn that way or this way, it's, it's where they're needed. And at the same point, this thing's calling, I need 11 amps. So 11 amps are flying up that way. 
These five amps will go here, joined with six from the source. So that's what's going on because they're exactly opposite each other. That's why I can end up taking my big amps minus my little amps and get how many amps the source needs to provide for these two reactive components. This six amps will go back and forth from the circuit, uh, from the circuit source. The five amps are just dancing back and forward. They're having a good old time. And that's the concept that we'll get into in future videos. If the capacitive amps happen to equal the inductive amps, let's say they were 10 amps and 10 amps, they would just sit there and dance back and forward, back and forward. And the circuit wouldn't need to provide anything. We're of course ignoring resistance, but those 10 amps would be happy in a theoretical sense. Resistance is kind of like friction, right? It slows stuff down. I think about getting on the freeway with my car. And if I get that thing up to 60 miles an hour, I should be able to just shut it off and go all the way home. Except for resistance, wind resistance, rolling resistance. Electrical circuits are no different. But in theoretical sense, that's how we look at some of these circuits. Okay, so that's my currents. So what does that really mean? That means these net six amps are going to the capacitor. So they're pointing up, capacitive direction. That's how I get my six amps here. It's the difference between these two, six amps. My resistive amps is eight. Let's do the Pythagorean theorem and look at a couple of formulas, see what we get. Either formula we use, Again, this one is just looking at these values. We haven't figured out what the difference is yet. So it's done within the formula. Should always make my C's look like proper C's, not like Kirby L's. Okay, so I take my resistive current, square it. That's this side of the triangle, easy to find. And then the difference of the two, just take the bigger minus the smaller. If you happen to get them backwards, it doesn't really matter because in a negative number squared, it's gonna end up positive again. So, but normally we take the bigger minus the little one, which really that part there in the parentheses is basically my IX, this difference here. The big one minus the little one leaves me this. And that's why I put that dashed line here. That's my IX. That's really the triangle that I'm using. And what does that equal if I plug it in? 10 amps. Now I can use my 10 amps. 120 volts divided by 10 amps gives me 12 ohms. And there we have it. Current and impedance done by finding, uh, impedance is found by finding my total current and then using Ohm's law. It's, it's generally the more straightforward. The other, as a reminder, and we'll do it in class, is a two-part formula. First of all, I have to combine these with a special formula, finding my total reactance. Then I will combine that total reactance with my resistance and get my impedance. And you'll notice this impedance needs to be smaller than my resistive branch. Doesn't necessarily need to be smaller than either one of these. They could be off a little or both of them could be less. It's kind of breaking the rules we had before, but not really because if I just had one of these, that wouldn't be the case. This impedance would be a lot smaller, but the two are working together. So here's the thing. Total current will always be greater than, equal to or greater than the resistive current and or the net reactive current. Again, these two play off each other. They could be trading back and forward 300 amps for all we care. It's what the circuit has to provide that we ultimately care about in our calculations.